thank you for that kind introduction and many thanks to the organizers of this conference from the Workers and Punks University. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here with you tonight and as someone <coughs> who has been a political activist since I was a teenager as well as somebody who writes about radical Marxist and revolutionary theory, uh, I particularly appreciate the Workers and Punks University's attempt to combine a serious commitment to theory with also an equally serious commitment to socialist politics. Now, parts of my remarks are going to closely follow sections of Marx's Capital, but I want to make it clear that I'm doing that not as a purely academic exercise, but because I think the set of problems that I'm going to focus on help us make sense of the world in which we live today and to the contours and configurations of the global working class. In particular, I think it allows us to begin to think about that very term, the global or world working class, in a more serious and, and systematic way. And I begin with a rudimentary, a basic proposition that every crisis in the reproduction of capital is also a crisis in the reproduction of labor power. The fundamental commodity that is not really a commodity because, it, as Marx says, human beings are the bearers of labor power. But that fundamental human capacity that allows capital to exist and to reproduce itself. But to say that a crisis of capital is a crisis in the reproduction of labor power means that capital uses the occasion of every crisis to try to devalue labor power, to try to lower its costs of reproduction, whether this is directly through wages or whether this is indirectly through the so-called social wage, health care, education, housing, and so on. And here, of course, capital's history repeats itself over and over, returning to the original scene of the crime. And that's really what primitive accumulation is for Marx in the first instance. It's the scene of the original crimes that set in motion the whole process of capital accumulation ultimately on a world scale. And Yet, as I say, capitalism returns to this over and over again, extending dispossession of people, the expropriation of the labor from the land and other means of production, as Marx described it. And all of this happens, these processes of ongoing primitive accumulation and devaluing of labor power, cheapening the costs of reproducing, human workers. All of this is accomplished in ways that both divide workers and unite them. And it's important that we recognize that both processes are happening all the time. There are attempts to divide workers along one sectional line after another. Workers in the public sector versus workers in the private sector. Men versus women. Immigrants versus non-immigrants and so on. And yet at the same time, Notwithstanding these divisions, workers are bound together in this unit, unifying logic of the system as a whole. And I want, in order to make some sense of this, to bring together these concepts of labor power and primitive accumulation with Marx's idea of social reproduction and what he calls the capitalist law of population. I'll come back and spend a few minutes talking about that shortly. I think if we do this, if we take this whole nexus of Marx's concepts together, labor power, social reproduction, primitive accumulation, the capitalist law of population, we can develop from Marx's fundamental insights uh, a set of analyses, ways of thinking about our current historical moment that can uh, certainly help us both theoretically and politically. 
Now, as you know, because your conference has been talking about this regularly, a key moment in the drama of Marx's capital, and by the way, in addition to being a theoretical text, I will argue that capital is also a dramatic text. Marx is dramatizing a human story in this text, trying to solve a mystery, the mystery of the commodity, and through it, of surplus value and capital accumulation. But the key moment in this drama arrives when Marx introduces us to the concept of labor power. This becomes a critical tool that allows him, as I say, to solve one mystery after another. And as a result, he must finish his work with the account, volume one of Capital, that is, he must finish it with the account of where labor power came from as a commodity on a mass scale. And so he finishes the text with the beginning. And he finishes it with the beginning because that's what a true dialectical drama does. It doesn't announce everything in advance. It proceeds systematically through the mysteries until it gets to the origin, to the scene of the crime, uh, as I called it. And yet, in interesting ways, although Marx clearly attached enormous importance to part eight of volume one of Capital on primitive accumulation, I'm going to suggest to you, as often happens with truly revolutionary works, Marx may not have fully seen the total significance, the complete significance of what he had accomplished there. I'm not saying he didn't see any of it, but I want to suggest to you that there are powerfully important ways in which we can build upon this analysis to address a further set of problems. One of the reasons I think that Marx doesn't fully appreciate just how powerful, how original and profound this account of primitive accumulation is, is because he thinks he has solved the problem of the reserve army of labor in the preceding section of Capital. Those of you who remember the structure of the book will know that chapter 25, just before we get to part eight on primitive accumulation, is called the general law of capitalist accumulation. And in that section, Marx introduces the reserve army of labor and what he calls the capitalist law of population. And in a nutshell, what Marx says to us there is that capital can regularly produce and reproduce a reserve army of labor, a section of the proletariat that is outside of wage labor that is without work or is only intermittently, casually, and periodically employed. And this reserve army of labor, as you know, is crucial because among other things, it helps exercise a downward pressure on wages. This is why mainstream economics always talks about the natural rate of unemployment. That's their concept, even though, of course, I think I can say, without having to justify it in this room, that there is no such thing as a natural rate of unemployment. It is social. It is generated by the mechanisms of capitalist accumulation. But they talk about a natural rate of unemployment because what they really mean is that there is a certain rate of unemployment necessary to undermine the bargaining power of labor with capital. If you have genuinely full employment, and labor is scarce, labor power is scarce, then workers all of a sudden have an enhanced bargaining power. And Marx is aware of this, and so he's trying to describe the mechanisms in capitalist accumulation that regularly produce this reserve army. And he tells us that this is accomplished, the production and reproduction of the reserve army of labor, by means of mechanization. It is the introduction of machines that at least relatively and sometimes absolutely displace labor. It's Marx's famous story, which is very, very well documented empirically across the history of capitalism, 
by which over time production tends to become more machine intense and less labor intense. <coughs> and this, Marx believes, is the mechanism which he calls the capitalist law of population, this displacement of labor by machines. He refers to it as a law of population peculiar to the capitalist mode of production. He ridicules the idea that there are any trans-historical laws of population. And he tells us that the formation of a surplus population, that's the other term he uses for this reserve army, the formation of this sur surplus population is a disposable industrial reserve army which belongs to capital just as absolutely as if capital had bred it for itself. Now, here Marx encounters a problem. And it's important for us to think about the problem because it manifests itself in all kinds of empirical ways, but also because I will suggest to you that his theory of primitive accumulation is a solution to this problem. And the problem is that the breeding of the working class that he refers to, of course, isn't done by capital. Capital does not produce labor power. Labor power is generationally produced and materially and socially reproduced in private households. It particularly involves key social roles played by women in the household, in nurturing the next generation and helping the current one of wage laborers to reproduce itself. But Marx isn't troubled to think through this problem in part because he believed the working class family was disappearing, but also because his description fit his historical circumstances. By which I mean, those economies which were undergoing capitalist industrialization were producing such enormous surplus populations that millions of people were leaving Europe. In the century prior to the First World War, for instance, 50 million people emigrated from Europe many of them to the Americas. And so the idea that capital regularly breeds a surplus population so massive, in fact, that large pro proportions of it leave the industrialized capitalist countries seem to empirically fit his historical moment and his historical situation. However, what Marx doesn't think about at this level is the fact that human biological reproduction is social, not natural. Marx talks about it at one point. He tells us that this reproduction is something that capital can leave safely to the workers' drives for self-preservation and propagation. But what we know from the historical evidence is that, in fact, by the late 19th century, and certainly by the early 20th centuries, in large parts of Europe, those sections that were most undergoing capitalist industrialization, working class women began to regulate their fertility and to reduce family sizes. In other words, reproduction couldn't be left to the self-instinct and the drive for self-preservation and propagation. As a result of this, the countries of the capitalist core have become systematically net importers of labor, not exporters of a surplus population. And we can see this as on a very grand uh, scale historically. The United Nations Population Fund uh, five or six years ago put out a report telling us that by 2050, the population of Europe would shrink by 125 million people without immigration. In other words, it is not the case that left to its own devices, the working class in the capitalist core countries is naturally reproducing itself. On the contrary, left to its own devices with declining family size, in fact, the working class will contract, 
and Marx's mechanism, the capitalist law of population by which workers are displaced by machines, will not be adequate to deal with that. And as I say, as a result, the law of population that Marx develops in chapter 25 of Capital doesn't fit our historical circumstances anymore. And yet, interestingly, I think Marx was already in Capital, right before the section on primitive accumulation, beginning to develop an alternative line of argument. And as, as I say, it's an alternative line of argument that makes primitive accumulation even more significant for understanding the way in which uh, our world works today. And I think we often find this in Marx. Situations where what I might describe as the dialectical propulsion, the dialectical energy of his own concepts starts to push and move the analysis to new levels, to formulate new ways of investigating the problems as to say that he, that he may not uh, fully have thought through. And let me try to illustrate for you what I'm saying by referring to the text, and then I will really come back and talk about primitive accumulation more. In the final section, section five of his chapter 25 on the general law of capitalist accumulation, Marx tells us that he will provide us with illustrations of the general law of capitalist accumulation. Remember, the general law is that mechanization displaces workers from the immediate process of production and creates a surplus population. That's the general law he set forth. The, the fifth section is devoted to, to the British agricultural population. Marx returns, in fact, to enclosures of the land, the concentration of landed ownership, the expulsion of laborers from the soil, which is, of course, the classic story of primitive accumulation. But technically speaking, Marx has this story in the wrong place. It belongs in part eight, doesn't belong in the capitalist law of population, and yet he has it there. The next section moves to Ireland. I want to talk about this for a moment because I think it's extremely significant for the ways in which we think about our world today. And he has this lovely line. Marx writes, in concluding this section, we must travel for a moment to Ireland. And that's a classic Marx, this literary way of getting us to move our imaginations somewhere else, as he does here. And then he discusses Ireland in terms of the centralization of land ownership. He talks about the massive emigration, the huge numbers of people being displaced who are leaving. He points out that in a period of four years, 1.6 million people in the 1850s, a period of, of four years, 1.6 million people leave Ireland. He describes Ireland's distinct economic dependency with respect to England. He refers to Ireland as, quote, merely an agricultural district of England. This is, of course, part of his overall theory of British colonization of Ireland. He even looks at something which has become hugely important in our world today if we really want to understand the global working class, and that is the remittances that Irish workers send back to their families from England to Ireland. And remittances, of course, are very, very common for migrant workers today, that part of what they earn in Europe or America or Canada, they send back home to support children, spouses, parents, and so on. And then, interestingly, he denounces the nationalist prejudices of the English against the Irish. And there are few places in Capital where he does this, but he finishes out this section. Now, the reason I'm drawing your attention to all of this is not because I want to show you that this is a particularly quirky thing that Marx does, but because I think Marx is already here beginning to pose the problem of the reserve army of labor and of the surplus population 
in relationship to primitive accumulation and in relationship to colonialism. The story of the reproduction of the working class in England, and I use that formulation very consciously, is not the English working class, it is the working class in England, because many of them are not English, they're Irish, they're African, and so on. But the story of the English working class is already, sorry, the working class in England is already a global story at this point. And Marx is picking up on all of this. And I want to suggest to you that the Irish story in many ways provides a key to thinking about the global working class today. And in particular, to the central importance of migrant labor, of labor that moves from one region to another, often very insecurely, very precariously, often without legal rights because it is so-called illegal in terms of its entry into new labor markets. In other words, that the reserve army of labor is truly global in its constitution. And indeed, that key to understanding the era of neoliberalism and its particular moment of austerity, I think, is to recognize the ways in which global displacement and dispossession, Marx's classic case of primitive accumulation, are being accelerated by this particular phase in the history of capitalism. Let me just offer you a few benchmarks for thinking about that. While none of our figures are foolproof, they capture the basic tendencies. And the basic tendencies tell us that during the neoliberal period of the last 30 years or so, the global working class has at least doubled in size. That is to say, producers separated from the soil who have no means of survival except their capacity to sell their labor power. Something like from about one and a half billion to something over three billion people. Now, that doesn't mean they're all in wage labor, because at the same time that this has happened, the global reserve army is something close to half of this class. I will come back to specifically migrant labor in a moment. And so we have a whole series of processes that have accelerated during the, the neoliberal period that account for this. Land grabs, water grabs, mining, oil, and resource exploration and development. As peasants, small farmers, and so on are driven off the land. These uh, process we, processes we see a lot of at the moment in Africa and Latin America, but one can never forget how colossal they have been and are in South Asia and Southeast Asia, <coughs> India and China, over the last several decades. Agrobusiness, ecotourism, large sections of land just cleared for wealthy tourists, the selling and leasing of land, particularly in Africa, enclosing of land for industrial purposes, to create special economic zones, build factories, and so on, which has been enormous in India and China. The exploitation of so-called natural disasters by states, where, for instance, Hurricane Mitch in Honduras in 1998, hundreds of thousands of people are simply, large, largely of African descent, are just driven off their lands as part of the rebuilding, quote unquote, exercise afterwards. The same thing goes for Hurricane Katrina in the United States in 2006. And then, of course, civil wars as means of displacement. There's a wonderful phrase by a, an economist from Colombia who says to us, there is not displacement because there is war in Colombia. There is war so that there might be displacement. And this idea that War is used sometimes as a means directly of displacing people, of carrying through primitive accumulation is crucial. And so we have lived through and are living through this period of enormous expansion in the world working class and in the global reserve army of labor. And capital's relationship 
to this growing working class is extremely complex. On the one hand, capital can go and relocate near where large masses of cheap labor are to be found, as, for instance, it has done in China. But similarly, cheap labor can be brought to the sites of work. And where production is highly fixed in spatial terms, very often, in fact, the laborers have to be brought to production. Think of agriculture. You're not going to relocate agriculture to China. It's spatially fixed on the lands and in the soils that are being used. Mining, construction. You can't go and build the apartment towers somewhere else and then move them. And so because you have all these spatially fixed forms of labor, very often migrant labor must be brought to where capital has these particular kinds of needs. And then, of course, industries like nursing and domestic labor, caring for children inside households, and so on, which huge numbers of migrant workers do in Europe and North America, uh, and which is heavily gendered caring labor done usually by women workers from the global south. As a result, for the migrant laborer, several things happen. One is they come into labor markets in which they typically lack full citizenship rights. In other words, they are disadvantaged. They have significantly reduced political and legal rights inside the new national labor markets. And I'll come back and give a few examples of this in a moment. But also, the reproduction of labor power becomes spatially fragmented. That is to say, you have the laborers who have migrated, but then you have usually, quite often, many of their children who are not with them. That labor power is being reproduced outside the labor market in which they are working. And of course, it means that capital and the state are not assuming any of those developmental costs of production, these children uh, of reproduction. These children, for instance, are being educated, cared for, uh, and so on, outside of the national labor market in which a parent or other caregiver is working. Now, Statistically, there are about one billion migrant laborers today, but a minority of them have crossed national borders. They are often in the kind of status that they have, for example, in China, where migrants from the countryside lack full legal rights when they come to the cities. Their legal rights pertain, for example, to access social services, for permanent housing, and so on are still in the countryside. There is a legal fiction that they reside elsewhere, even though they labor in the cities. But of these migrant laborers, over 200 million of them are working outside their country of origin, forming a particularly precarious section of the global working class. In fact, I'll suggest to you that migrant laborers are the ideal precarious workers of the age of austerity. They are ideal because they are so instantly disposable. If the particular work that they have been contracted to do disappears, in one way or another, the state has the authority to get rid of them, and with the growth of so-called guest workers, programs or temporary foreign work programs, this becomes in fact a legal basis of their migration. So that where I live in Canada, for instance, in the last 10 years, the temporary foreign worker program has tripled. There are now about 340,000 temporary foreign workers in Canada. Legally, they can be paid 15% less than the going wage for that job. They are tied to an employer 
They are brought in to work for one employer and one employer alone. They don't have the right to change jobs. And if for whatever reason they quit that job or leave that job, they immediately lose any legal status in the country. And that legal status uh, is very precarious to begin with. As a result, we get this extremely interesting contradiction of the neoliberal age, which is that capital in the global north wants large amounts of this global reserve army of labor. It wants tens of millions of them to come and to work, to do the hardest jobs, the lowest paying jobs, the most precarious jobs, and so on. But at the same time, it wants to do this on a basis in which these workers feel permanently insecure. As a result, if you look at the United States where the estimates are there are 12 or 13 million so-called illegal or undocumented workers, workers who don't have legal papers to be in the United States, capital knows they are necessary, capital says they are necessary, but at the same time there is an enormous apparatus of surveillance and repression directed towards them. Just the U.S.-Mexico border, for instance, is militarized at a cost of $2 billion a year. In terms of the weaponry, the police agents, uh, and so on, the costs of militarily policing that border with the United States. Every year, hundreds of workers die trying to cross that border, and 300,000 women, children, and men are arrested and imprisoned, detained in some way, and then deported uh, sooner or later. Of those who do make it across the border, hundreds of thousands more are arrested and put in over 400 detention centers, essentially just you know, enormous prisons full of migrants in the United States. Uh, and many of these are privatized detention centers because, of course, this is the age of neoliberalism and primitive accumulation, right? So, of course, they're privatized, uh, and the conditions in them are appalling. And so, as I say, when we talk about the world working class today, I'm trying to make the case to you that we need to think about it outside the framework of national labor markets. We need to think about it as a truly global class, and we need to think about the reserve army of labor as truly global in these terms. And I think as a result, the analysis that has been done by a number of Marxist writers about the neo-racism of this particular period, in which the figure of the immigrant becomes deeply racialized in one site of capitalism in the global north uh, after another becomes uh, extremely important. Racism serves as an ideological legitimation for this system that some have tried to describe as global apartheid, but certainly this differentiation of legal political rights of different sections of the working class inside a given national labor market. And of course, I don't need to tell those of you who are living in Europe about the rise of anti-immigrant parties, for instance, uh, across much of Europe, uh, the growing attacks on so-called multiculturalism that have been launched by the presidents and prime ministers of Britain, Italy, France, Germany, and so on all of them saying that the so-called multicultural model has been proved now not to work, and so on. But also, in this crisis period, we see an intensification of racist violence towards migrant workers. And I will remind you that just two weeks ago, 27 migrant workers from Bangladesh were shot in Greece. These were workers picking strawberries who had not been paid for six months 
and began to organize and to strike to demand their unpaid wages. Uh, and it, I can't mention Bangladesh without also pointing out how the Bangladeshi working class serves precisely this function I'm talking about, where capital can migrate to where they are, millions of them working in garment factory sweatshops of the sort that just collapsed a week or so ago, killing at least 300 of them, but also migrating across borders, coming to countries like Italy to pick strawberries and, uh, and to suffer racist violence. All of this I want to suggest, as I say, is fundamental to how we understand the global working class and also, as I'm trying to emphasize to you, the role of primitive accumulation as an ongoing process that is constituting and reconstituting the reserve army of labor and the industrial working class uh, throughout the world. But it would be a mistake for me to talk about this without also coming back to some of the key political struggles of the moment around this, because I want to conclude my remarks by highlighting a couple of key points. One is the imperative for an anti-racist working class politics that fundamentally advances the rights of migrant workers, that understands every worker inside a national labor market as part of the local working class, that challenges the ideas that there, that there are outsiders, foreigners, people who are alien to the actual working class, but also to emphasize that despite how precarious their situation is, despite the violence that they suffer, immigrant workers in one place after another are organizing, they are resisting, they are mobilizing. And I just want to share a few examples of that with you. Probably the most important center for this kind of resistance by immigrant workers uh, in recent years has, of course, been Los Angeles. And their major union organizing campaigns of immigrant workers uh, have been the backbone of organizing drives for janitors, people who clean buildings, for construction workers, carpenters, and drywallers, and so on. And some very, very significant battles have been fought. Uh, in 2003, a very important event in the United States, the Immigrant Workers' Freedom Ride, laid some of the basis for May Day 2006, when something like a million immigrant workers across the United States walked off the job and essentially reclaimed May Day in the United States, where, of course, our great traditions of May Day were born in Chicago after Haymarket. Similarly, the development of the International Domestic Workers Network, a group that is organizing women domestic workers in Argentina, Brazil, Jamaica, Uruguay, Colombia, uh, and other places, but also working with the National Domestic Workers Alliance in the U.S., which has been making particularly strong inroads in New York. Also, 2009-10, we saw a strike of 6,000 undocumented workers in Paris, the strike of the so-called sans-papiers, those without documents, without papers, who, through sit-down strikes and other protests, actually won a path to legalization and citizenship as a result of those protests. And I can give you many other examples of cross-border organizing across the Mexico-US border, uh, but the last one I will share with you was very important uh, strike action last month in Italy by a large section of, mig of uh, migrant workers, many of them without legal documents, working in the so-called logistics sector, uh, full of sweatshops. So now to bring this back to my starting point, what I'm trying to set out for you is a case, both theoretically, that 
we need to understand primitive accumulation as at the heart of what Marx calls the capitalist law of population today. That if we don't, we fail to understand the mechanisms through which a global reserve army of labor is produced. And I think Marx, although that was not the formulation that he gives us in Capital, was, as I suggested, already seen some of the outlines of such an understanding of primitive accumulation and the development and reproduction of the surplus population. But I'm also trying to suggest to you that the new lefts that I think all of us in this room are trying to build this year and in the years ahead need to work with this sort of understanding of the working class so that we never lose sight of the central, fundamental, strategic, political importance of an anti-racist working class politics in which the interests and needs of migrant workers, the defense of migrant workers and solidarity with their struggles uh, figure centrally, because it does seem to me that that for us is the practical meaning of Marx and Engels claiming the manifesto that the workers have no country, but that they do have a world to win. Thank you. Thank you, David, very much for this fascinating and exciting lecture. I'm uh, most certain that there will be lots of questions and comments. So, dear comrades, the floor is yours. If you want to pose a question, give a comment, just raise your hand and you'll be given a mic. Uh, yes, we have two over there. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fantastic. I have a comment, a question perhaps. Um, it is, I agree with you, absolutely vital to try to extend chapter 25 of uh, Capital Volume 1 to, uh, by incorporating the spatial dimensions and the spatial immobilities. And that's precisely what you did with what you did with respect to the mobility of the labor force. But I think that there's other side, dialectically connected to this, which is the mobility of capital itself. You mentioned it once, in terms of capital moving elsewhere in search for lower labor cost, which is of course happening, but also for other reasons why capital moves. Um, so in chapter 25, in the, in the, in the formulation of the general law of population, Marx focuses exclusively, as you said, on technological change, mechanization, who does not consider the geographical mobility of capital as an integral element in the formation of a labor reserve domestically. And that then, I would argue, if we, if we do consider alongside mobilities of labor force, the mobilities of capital permits then to see, to link it to primitive accumulation because the mobilities of capital, that is the movement of capital elsewhere, not just industrial capital, investment capital, etc., the mining, the land grabbing, the water grabbing, and others that you mentioned, are precisely part of the processes of mobility of capital from one place to another, producing or co-producing dynamics of primitive accumulation with the leaves of people from the means of subsistence which then in turn <laughs> opens up this global labor reserve that permits the mobilities that you talked about. So it's this kind of double dialectic. So that's one comment, if you allow me a second uh, thing, which is the geographical disciplining of migrating bodies, particularly in the European Union uh, and when you focused on, quite rightly so, when you focused on Greece, Italy, Spain, and places like that, where we see acute rise of violent forms of racism, etc., has, of course, almost everything to do with the geographical regulation of the European Union. That is the rules, the European Union rules say that it have to apply for permission to be in the EU in the country to which they arrive in the EU. So there is no mobility for 
immigrant workers within the EU while they're there, because the Greenies, Belgians, English, etc. Well, of course, none of the immigrants who arrive today in Greece, Italy, or Spain want to stay there. They want to go to Germany, to England, to Sweden, for very obvious reasons, yet they get stuck there in a context in which the local configuration cannot any longer deal with this uh, uh, accumulation of precarious bodies, both domestic and immigrant, but which is directly connected to the geographically select, selected by a political regulation of these bodies. Do you prefer taking more questions? Okay, then Henry, please. Um, I'm a bit more skeptical about some of the connections that David has drawn so in such vivid and interesting ways in his talk. First of all, if one considers this uh, overarching sketch and analysis of the growth of the world working class and especially global reserve army uh, during the period you mentioned, and you gave uh, a, a good example of some of the mechanisms, I mean land grabbing, mining ventures, uh, and, and the rest of it, um, are you implying that those are all driven by capital and driven by capital if they are, but for the, and, and wars was another example, for the purpose of growing the global reserve army of labor or the global working class? That I think is um, possibly problematic. Um, certainly, uh, land grabbing in Africa is uh, much exaggerated, in fact, in practice, rather than as a, a statement of intent. And often the land is grabbed, is grabbed, is grabbed where not many people live. Um, and if it's grabbed by mining companies, it's because they want the minerals under the soil, not because they are trying to expand the global reserve army. So I think there's a, you know, there's some disaggregation. And I could give many more examples, but just let me say something about China. Because China is absolutely fascinating, and there is a debate among progressive scholars in China about what primitive accumulation means in China. And one of the characteristic points they arrive at, which is a kind of impasse, is it's not like England in the last part of Capital Volume 1, because it's voluntary. Now that obviously sounds a warning, but the fact is there has not been much land dispossession at all in China that would explain the 150 million upwards migrant workers. And moreover, China's continued to feed itself through its highly distinctive form of extremely small-scale farms, a country with 1.3 billion people. So there's something else going on. I, I, I think Marxist concepts are absolutely central to understanding it. And I just want to mention a, a very interesting book which I was telling Michael Leibowitz about. It's called How Migrant Labour Changed Rural China. And the area studied by this uh, anthropologist, Rachel Murphy, I, I'm not saying it's typical because no single area in China is typical, but a substantial proportion of the migrants who came back after this cyclical migration, they returned to the countryside, they had two very clear things, most of them in mind. They never wanted to work for a boss again. That was their experience of sweatshops and factories. And, and they didn't want to farm again. And a number of them, a sufficient minority, have invested in quite successful small local businesses. Now, which is part of the success story, if you like, of rural China. Does that mean they've changed their class location? Uh, what, 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 is, what is happening here? So a sufficient minority have invested not just in services, but in small scale industry and so on. And this is one of the massive differences between rural China and rural India, for example. So I would want to bring in some of these questions and more differentiated um, aspects of, of the bigger story. I'm oh, sorry, one last thing, just to I'm curious, you know, The Economist in Britain, which is a sort of fairly consistent kind of neoliberal, you know, their line on is to abolish all immigration 
Why? Because the completely free movement of this global reserve army would be the right thing that would make for properly free labor markets in their conception. But as we know, this flies in the face of exactly as you said, the politics, uh, which Eric would also mentioned, the politics of immigration control. So I think again there's a there's something there that we you know we need to think about and, and we need to address. And to remember that in the previous period of the long capitalist boom, Europe was importing labour on a massive scale because there was a boom. Turkish workers in Germany, Afro-Caribbean, South Asian immigrants to Britain and so on. Um, so I'm just trying to unpack or take apart some of the it's extremely brilliant, connected, everything's driving everything else that David's presented us with. Okay, do you want one more or is sure. this? Yeah, okay, Stephen, please. Uh, thank you. Um, this may, this may be minor point or even just a question of phrasing, but you said at one point we have to think beyond national labor markets. But I think that um, that um, what basically um, um, the general uh, out, uh, outlines of your arguments is uh, show that precisely that it's not a question of going beyond them as methodologically, but to understand their adequate position, they're still functional. It is for the a global reserve army of labor, for it to be to be global, to to fully, fully realize its potential for capital, it is precisely important that the labor market be still nationally segmented. Because with that come, uh, as you said, um, uh, certain rights, uh, political rights, but also social rights, uh, are tied to citizenship. So uh, it is uh, important aspect is precisely that there is a labor power that you can import, which, uh, which does not participate uh, to, to put it uh, in strict Marxian terms, in the historical moral standards of the, uh, the established for, uh, through, let's say, class struggle um, within a, a certain uh, national, uh, within the framework of a certain uh, nation state. Because this is tied to citizenships, the, the German workers or whatnot, they are the ones, uh, they, uh, through, through past struggles, there is an established uh, value of labor power, and it has a, a historical moral standard. But then introduce people who are uh, basically uh, who are, have not the rights uh, to participate in this. So you re, uh, redefine. So for them, there is a different level of value of labor power. So uh, this, uh, so this is why this, I would say, it, it may be just a question of rephrasing it or uh, just to emphasize it. But uh, um, so, so um, the importance of, of, of there still persisting uh, national uh, labor markets besides a global uh, reserve of labor, that is, that is the, the, uh, the center of the functional next So, So, well, this is what I heard from you, Tom. Okay, I guess this is enough for the first round, and then we'll have more. Those are great questions, and I'm sure I won't do justice to them all. I will try to take some stabs some of them. Starting on Eric's, I totally agree that because Marx works much of the time in Capital Volume 1, as he puts it, as if the whole world economy were just a, a single national economy, you're, you're absolutely right that he has mobility of capital, but he doesn't have transnational mobility of capital. But of course, because Marx's thinking is always jumping ahead, he regularly violates his own protocol. Uh, and I think it's sometimes very interesting, the ways in which he does that. Because remember, I was talking with Mike, Michael Leibowitz about this last night, I remain convinced that Marx was ultimately wedded to the big six book plan, which had to end with the world market and world crisis. And so his thought, even when he, say, he says, as a simplifying assumption, we'll treat the whole world as a single market economy, he's jumping ahead a lot. And as you could see, I, found, I find particularly interesting. But there are other places where he does that. He even does it uh, in the discussion of national wages, for instance. And also he jumps outside the national labor market, for instance, as he starts to theorize this. Uh, but I totally agree that, that 
that transnational capital mobility is also outside the discussion. And as a result, at that level, he hasn't yet thought through this very complex, and I agree, dialectical set of connections in which some modality, capital in some modalities can relocate production outside its quote-unquote home base, but similarly in which workers can be moved into the national labor market in precisely the ways that, that we were talking about. So I think it's, it's a very nice addition to the, the, the point that, uh, that I was developing from, from the other side. And I, I entirely agree with your formulation that on the side that I was emphasizing, this creates a legion of uniquely precarious bodies inside these national labor markets that they are simultaneously inside and outside, legally and politically, uh, and I'll come back to, to that point in, in a moment. Uh, Henry, I'm sure I can't do justice to that big package of issues that, that you raised. Some parts of it are straightforward for me. Uh, I don't believe displacement is for the purposes of creating a global reserve army of labor. I entirely agree. It is capital's drive to access, enclose, privatize certain kinds of assets or potential assets that then produces displacement. And I think really that's Marx's analysis in part eight on primitive accumulation as well. I don't think he's, he's attributing the conscious motive, although I think he's aware there are political economists who see the advantages of displacement and are starting to think it through. But uh, I entirely agree that this is one, one means by which all of this anarchic self-interested activity of capital is producing this, for them, uh, very compatible, unintended set of, uh, of effects. And I'm not happy with the term voluntary. Uh, when we talk about Chinese peasants and small farmers leaving the land, but I do accept, which I think was also the case even in Britain, that not all workers who left the land did so because they had been physically displaced. And interestingly, if I were really to develop this line of argument, I think Ireland is also part of that story. Uh, I think many poor Irish farmers slash peasants left not because they were expropriated, but because moving into circuits of wage labor for a whole variety of complex social historical reasons seemed to offer, if we can put it in this jargon, more secure means of self-reproduction of themselves and their households. And uh, so I prefer that way of framing it than the, uh, the, the term uh, voluntary, but I really, the book you recommended is something I will have to look at as, as, as I try to develop uh, this argument. And the final thing I would say about you know, your really rich and provocative comments is that I think you were starting towards the end just to hint at something that I ought to have said in my presentation, it was somewhere in my notes and I didn't, which is that part of the reconfiguration of immigration in the age of austerity, and I was using Canada as a case in point, it's the one I know best, uh, part of that reconfiguration is that the post-war boom pattern in which immigration for settlement was the dominant pattern. I believe it was being wound down significantly relative to the temporary foreign worker programs. So that to use the cases here that I know best, uh, in 2009 in Canada for the first time, more people entered the country as temporary foreign workers than did as permanent residents or landed immigrants. And this was, that, that, this was, I say, this was the first time, of course. What this is telling us is that increasingly immigration policy is being tailored just overtly to the needs of capital. And one of the very interesting aspects of the so-called immigration debate in the United States right now 
is that you know, there's a particular agenda that Obama and the White House are pursuing, and it does involve, <coughs> this also happened under Bush the Little, uh, it, uh, it does involve a path to normalization and regularization for millions of undocumented uh, people, but the business groups are actually interestingly pointing to Canada and saying they know what a modern immigration policy looks like, this enormous growth in so-called guest worker programs. Uh, and I, the point that, that you made, Comrade, I, I, I'm in fundamental agreement. I guess what I was trying, when I used that, that term thinking beyond the national labor market, what I was trying to get at was precisely what you were describing, this complex relationship in which the outer becomes part of the inner, but they do with this outer status, okay? They don't have membership, but their labor power can be fully exploited. And I think trying to think that through in a more systematic way is part of our task, uh, both theoretically and politically. So, yeah, I'm happy to take more. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, so Michael, I always says please. Yeah, David, I, I loved your talk. Um, I thought it was a um, excellent, really excellent discussion of the section in Chapter 25 on the Irish. Um, and really good. And what I like especially about the talk is that it was not an abstract discussion, that it was a politically informed discussion, and one that is an excellent example of the, the way to use capital as a political weapon. Um, and I think that's really important. It's not done enough, you know, being a Marxist economist, I constantly come up against people who want to talk about the falling rate of profit, proving it or transformation of profit, that, which I view as a waste of scarce intelligence. I think what you're doing is absolutely right. There is, I think, a problem in your argument, a trivial one. Um, and that is, you get all this really from chapter 25, which is the section on capitalist accumulation, accumulation within capitalist relations. And that, to me, is a demonstration of Marx's point that once capital stands on its own feet, stands on its own foundations, it then continues the process that was occurring in its original formation. Yes. So from that perspective, it seems to me that you, know, you demonstrate Marx's point rather than point to this belonging to the concept of primitive accumulation or original accumulation. So that, I think that's trivial. Uh, I'll even accuse you of opportunism for raising the question of prop, primitive accumulation here for this conference. <laughs> okay, yes, please. Uh, just a small question. Uh, I want to, to uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, say something about the phenomenon I think is important for, for the things you, you talked about, but you didn't mention it. And uh, in Serbia it is really a uh, fundamental question, it is really uh, uh, important. It is the semi-proletariat, what we call it. Uh, that is the, the type of people that work in the city, but are linked to the countryside, yes. not in the way the Irish workers were linked to uh, to their families in I Ireland by sending the wages, but more in, in the opposite way, that the, uh, the family in the countryside sends food uh, to the worker in the city. And this, uh, this makes the worker uh, uh, ready or able to work for less. And uh, so this, in a way, maybe, and we talked about it a bit yesterday, uh, that we cannot talk about primitive accumulation uh, so much in post-socialist countries here, uh, because it is in a way opposite. You, the worker is not really uh, 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 separated from the means of existence, but uh, still he, he goes to, to town to work, even if his bare existence is already already guaranteed. So, so and that, that is now the question, maybe, uh, do you see in the picture that you've drawn a place for the question of needs? Because the question of semi-proletariat is really the question of needs. The worker goes to the town 
because he has to earn a wage, to earn some money, because some, uh, uh, some needs cannot be satisfied without money. And uh, I, I, I think that is important, and uh, Professor per Perlman talked about it uh, on the first day here, because he said, uh, about, he mentioned Ricardo's account of, uh, of Ireland when he says, uh, what we need to do with the workers in Ireland uh, who are lazy, we uh, have to make them become more civilized. That means to have more needs so that they must go out to the uh, labor market. Okay. Should we take one more? Yes, Michael Perlman, please. Thank you. Uh, I don't have to repeat how good the talk was, uh, but I do want to make the suggestion that. What seems to be happening in the Western countries now with the increased mechanization is that the new fear, perhaps it's overstated, is that the um, digital economy is going to now make it impossible to provide sufficient work for the existing labor supply and wondering how to handle it. Of course, they're not going to mention one easy way of handling it would be to reduce the hours or the days of work. but. Um, that seems to be on the table now, where the potential of creating, say, uh, a full employment, an employment that would allow you to have an uh, employment that would make it possible to keep the reserve army of the unemployed within balance. That is, I don't think it's necessary now to create the reserve, unemployment, reserve army of unemployment, but rather it's necessary to find a way to deal with its unbounded expansion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I just wonder one maybe politically concrete question. Do you see ways to use what you just described and impact for us in ways that uh, a huge growing surface uh, population of uh, surface amounts of labor, especially immigrant labor, is not like you said stuck can't leave, there's no jobs. Where are the links and points of solidarity between the domestic labor and the union labor? And what can we use for marketing framework to offer something that is maybe not the conventional liberal excuses for dealing with unemployment? Again, thank you for all of the comments. One of the great things about being up here and having presented to you is that people start uh, pushing me to enrich and develop my own analysis in uh, very, very helpful ways. And uh, beginning, of course, with Michael Leibowitz uh, accusing me of opportunism for uh, having used primitive accumulation. But, but really, Michael, I think your point is right that I think that Marx has, in his conceptual map, this notion that capitalist accumulation is, as he puts it, the reproduction of the capital wage labor relation on an extended scale, which, of course, particularly as he starts to think about issues of the world market, has to involve him in thinking about the way these processes are internally related and the, I suppose, the dangers, I don't want to be suggesting that these are sort of separate, externally related. They're, these are internally related processes of capital accumulation and ongoing primitive accumulation. And I think it's true that some of the literature has tended not to make that link. And as a result, we get some formulations and some literature that suggests the exploitation of labor has now been displaced by purely predatory stuff, theft and so on. And you're right, what I'm trying to insist on is, is the integrity of the expansion of this exploitative relationship which also involves uh, ongoing primitive accumulation uh, as, as you put it. And Similarly, the, the question about the semi-proletariat and Serbia uh, as a case in point, I think is extremely interesting. Henry knows more about a number of these cases in the world today than I do. 
he's written about both India and parts of Africa in this regard. But you know, one of the really classic cases for thinking this problem through uh, is, of course, the South African Bantustan system, where you have, as you put it, a semi-proletariat. These people are going to the mines and so on, but they have these ties back to the land. And in some cases, those ties are, of course, part of the lower cost of reproduction via wages. Uh, in exactly the way that, that you've described. And that's, that's something that ultimately needs to be integrated in the kind of analysis I'm doing if it's to capture all the complexities of, uh, of these, the, these relationships as, as you're talking about. Uh, and Michael, in terms of your point on the, on the digital economy and the surplus population, I'm really interested in trying to think through but I don't have an adequate theorization of this. Those passages where Marx talks about the sometimes hypergrowth of the surplus population, lowering overall wage rates, and actually as a result inhibiting mechanization for periods of time, because there's so much cheap labor around. And of course, this can happen uh, with you know, very, very different sectors of the economy so that you can get the cybernetic digital stuff driving one sector while you then get this enormous growth, for instance, of <coughs> various cheap labor, fast food service production, for instance, which, you know, when I watch them put a Big Mac together or at McDonald's or something, this is assembly line production. Uh, but incredibly labor intensive and, and so on. And that brings me to, to the last point, which I didn't try to cover in this paper because I didn't think I could do justice to it. But one of the things which I think gets posed by a whole number of social processes today for us is to be prepared to radically rethink forms of working class organization to think outside the model that I think for most, most of Europe, and certainly North America, uh, became the norm, which is you know, the classic collective bargaining norm. Because one of the things which I found very instructive about some of the recent uh, struggles in the United States is that you have a variety of working class protests, some of them heavily involving migrant labor, uh, who don't have a union in the classic sense. And I'm thinking both of the, uh, the protests at Walmart in the United States, where workers were coming out, walking off the job in some cases, in solidarity with activists from the labor movement and local communities and so on, but they don't have a contract. They're not covered by a collective agreement. But they're using working class weapons, the strike, the walkout, the solidarity protest, and so on. And the same thing, which is fascinating, I mean, in New York State, the Domestic Workers Alliance, many of whom are immigrant workers, of course, because they're working in people's households, the Domestic Workers Alliance now has 10,000 members in the state of New York. But of course, they don't have a collective agreement with the individual employer in the household. Now, I would argue it's a working class organization. It is doing all kinds of collective union things. It is fighting to establish limits on the hours of work for domestic workers. They should, they're trying to move them towards the 40-hour work week, for instance. Pay for overtime work and so on. But this has to be done in relationship to the state, not by way of bargaining with individual employers. So I think some of the issues that you were raising speak to our ability to imagine and reimagine what working class organizing looks like uh, today. And I'm always reminded uh, that many of the examples uh, that we need come from parts of the global south that have been much further ahead on this. And I'm thinking particularly of the organizing that happened in the Bolivian city of Cochabamba 
uh, in the run-up to the water wars uh, of 2000, where Oscar Oliveira and other trade union activists in Cochabamba said there was a new world of work. And it was younger and more female than the older working class movement that they had been a part of. Uh, and they had to learn to go into the streets and meet these workers, establish worker centers in the center of town, and so on, because many of them were working in small little shops of four people, and so on. So, yeah, one of the things which I think does flow from the analysis I'm presenting is that we need a more complex model of what working class organizing is going to look like in this period, which doesn't mean that there won't still be the classic battles of the unionized mass production of public sector workers, but there will be, I think, a lot of other fronts of struggle. And very often the left, I think, repeats certain historical examples from the past as if these fit every situation for all time, rather than actually grappling. As I say, I think there are new emergent forms of working class self-organization uh, around us, and we need to begin to think those through, both theoretically and, of course, strategically. Okay, I guess we're ready for another round. So please, questions and comments. Um, no one? <laughs> well, I guess uh, in that case, I'll just use this opportunity to announce the tomorrow's schedule. Uh, beginning at uh, 10 in the morning, we are having a press conference uh, that will announce the uh, public start of the Initiative for Democratic Socialism. Um, that event will be held in Slovene, but if any of you are interested, you are of course kindly uh, invited to participate. Uh, following that will be at uh, 11, uh, panel on uh, primitive accumulation as a factor in fiscal sustainability policies and following that will be a panel on socialist alternative and at 6 p.m. we are having another keynote lecture by Michael Lebowitz that's titled primitive accumulation versus contested reproduction thank you very much and see you tomorrow